my latest blood test results are in, so what's my biological age? So each of the variables for Levine's phenotypic age, otherwise known as biological age calculator, are on the screen. And we can see that my uh, uh, biological age is 34.54 years, which compared to my chronological age, 47, is 12 and a half years younger than my chronological age. So uh, in comparison, uh, the, for the first four blood tests in 2020, I had values of 34 and a half, 33.4, 35.7, and on my last blood test, which was the worst uh, reading that I've had to date, um, 39.3. So on this latest blood test, I was able to reduce my biological age by five years. Now also, uh, when taking the average of the five values for my biological age, uh, it's 35 and a half years. Now we can compare that to my 2019 value over two blood tests of 35.2 years uh, to uh, suggest that I've aged biologically by 0 0.3 years, even though one full year uh, on, on the calendar has passed. Now I'm confident that I can further reduce my 34.54 to somewhere around 33 again, um, so stay tuned. And also if I'm able to do that, that, may redu that would likely reduce my uh, average biological age potentially to somewhere around 35.2, 35.2, which would be great because then it would suggest that I haven't aged biologically even though one full year has passed. So stay tuned for that data. So what's driving the five year, approximately five year uh, reduction, age reduction in, in biological age from test number four to test number five? So here are a few of those va uh, variables. And what we're looking at is the uh, period uh, that corresponds to this blood test is from July 28th through October 27th. Uh, so that's the period that corresponds to blood test number five. And for blood test number four, it was a shorter period from June 24th through July uh, 27th of 2020. So first, my uh, calorie intake between those two periods wasn't significantly different, but it was 100 calories higher uh, in this latest um, uh, period that corresponds to blood test number five. Now that, even though those the calorie values weren't different between the two um, different periods, that extra 100 calories a day was sufficient to increase my body weight, my average body weight, I weigh myself daily too, in addition to all the other things that I track. Uh, my average body weight uh, went up by two pounds. So 100 calories a day is enough to raise your body weight. Uh, I didn't exercise more fre frequently in this period uh, uh, when compared with uh, the blood test number four measurement. So I've coded um, days that I exercise, whether it was strength, strength training, um, running, or biking. Uh, I don't include walking as, as an exercise day. It's very low intensity. So if I did any of those three things, I coded it as one, whereas if I didn't, it was a zero. So the frequency of my exercise um, uh, wasn't different between those two periods. Uh, so cardiovascular metrics, heart rate variability, HRV, and resting heart rate, RHR. I improved my fitness, well, at least for heart rate variability, I uh, significantly improved that by a small amount. Uh, and my resting heart rate, even though it was improved, wasn't significantly different uh, between the two uh, periods. But I'd argue that you know a small increase in HR, uh, HRV wouldn't be enough to explain a five-year reduction in, in biological age. I find that hard to believe. So I think it's more likely that there are components of my diet, which I purposefully changed for this dietary period compared to the last, that may be in, uh, impacting my biological age. So what was different in my diet? So a uh, big data slide. Um, uh, this is my average dietary intake uh, for the uh, period that corresponds to blood test number five versus the period that corresponds to blood test number four. Now, I'm not going to go through all these data, and the t-test indicates the p-values that you know indicates uh, significant differences differences between the groups. Um, but for those who are interested in knowing what my diet is to have a younger, a way younger bi uh, biological age than my chronological age, I wanted to include all the data so people who are uh, uh, interested in that can look at it. I'm only going to focus on a few key points of uh, dietary changes on the list. So first, uh, compared to the period for blood test number four versus number five, I purposely increased my uh, vegetable intake by about 360 grams, as you can see there. So which vegetables did I increase? Well, I increased my broccoli, cauliflower, those are the two major ones, but I also increased uh, peas, and I didn't highlight it, but corn too, I increased that by a little bit. Um, so not just uh, uh, vegetable intake did I change, I also changed my yogurt intake, how much yogurt, uh, full fat, plain yogurt that I mix with berries uh, that I was eating every day. Uh, so what we can see is for blood test number five, I cut it uh, by about half compared with blood test number four, so about four, uh, 439 grams in for the previous period versus 234 grams for this period. 
So why did I make those dietary changes prior to this blood test? Well, a higher vegetable intake, and this was data based on up to my previous blood test. Uh, for, for that data, a higher vegetable intake was correlated with lower glucose and creatinine and a higher lymphocyte percentage. Now these are, uh, going in those directions are favorable for biological age. And for more info on that, I'll link uh, to a video in the right corner where I discussed how each of these variables on the biological age calculator change during aging and disease risk. So click that if you're interested. All right, so let's look at, have a look at the data. So first we're looking at um, average uh, my, my glucose levels versus my average daily vegetable intake. And again, this is data based on previous to this blood test that led me to change it for this blood test. So what we can see is a negative correlation, meaning the higher my average daily vegetable intake, the lower my glucose levels. And notice these aren't small, relatively small amounts of vegetables. This is, you know, uh, in some cases, 1,700 grams a day, which would be uh, about 22 servings, with 80 grams, around 80 grams being considered a, a serving. So higher, higher average uh, daily vegetable intake, lower correlated with lower glucose. Similarly, higher vegetable intake is also correlated with lower creatinine, which is going in the right direction. Creatinine increases with age, and higher levels of creatinine are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, conversely, having a higher average daily vegetable intake was cor is correlated or was correlated with a higher percentage of lymphocytes, and we can see that correlation there. It's very strong, 0.81, and all of these correlations are statistically significant. So uh, the correlations for higher vegetable intake with the nine biomarkers on Levine's biological age calculator weren't all going in the right direction. One of them, uh, alkaline phosphatase, ALP, so higher vegetables, higher ALP, which is going in the wrong direction. Uh, higher ALP, uh, ALP increases during aging and higher levels, uh, levels higher than 50 are associated with an increased uh, all-cause mortality risk. So uh, the way I looked at it is improve three variables, maybe one gets worse. I see that as a net positive. So um, and also, I uh, didn't see significant associations for vegetable intake with albumin, uh, white blood cells, MCV, RDW, or CRP, the other variable, variables on the biological age calculator. So I, for this blood test, blood test number five, I increased my vegetable intake. Uh, now, whether the increased vegetable intake for this blood test caused uh, improvements for glucose, creatinine, or the lymphocyte percentage is unknown, but each of them went in the right direction. All right, so I also mentioned that I cut my yogurt intake in half. Why did I do that? And I've talked about this a little bit in, in, in another video, so I'm not going to go too in-depth. But uh, briefly, so my glucose levels, I've listed them here without yogurt and then with yogurt. I went for a long time not eating yogurt in my diet and a shorter time, obviously, here uh, having yogurt in my diet. And what we can see is that my glucose levels, including yo yogurt, uh, are significantly higher compared to when I don't have yogurt in my diet. The same trend is true for creatinine. With yogurt in my diet, higher creatinine. Without yogurt in my diet, lower creatinine. So, um, and these two groups of data are statistic, uh, they're different based on uh, t-test, p-values with the t-test. So this would suggest that I should reduce or eliminate yogurt if I want to have lower glucose and creatinine. Now, I'm not excited to cut yogurt completely out. And one reason for that is because they seem to impact my red blood cell levels. So this is what we're looking at, red blood cell uh, on the y-axis versus yogurt intake. And um, when I didn't eat yogurt, uh, my red blood cell range, and this is uh, over the past five years from 2015 to 2020, correlations for, again, red blood cells versus uh, yogurt intake, average daily yogurt intake. So we can see that without yogurt, my red blood cell range was around 4.4 to 4.8. So why is that important? Well. Uh, this is how red blood cells, uh, levels of red blood cells change during aging in both men and women with, with values in men uh, around 4.8 being found in biological youth. And red blood cell counts decrease during aging. Uh, uh, that's a bad thing because red blood cells carry oxygen. If you don't have enough oxygen, your cells can't use that oxygen to, pour, to make you know, energy uh, uh, by mitochondria. So you don't want your red blood cells to, to be lower. So... Um, for whatever reason, yogurt seems to impact them and my red blood cells increase. And we can see that here. So with more than 400 grams of yogurt a day, my, I was able to achieve red blood cell levels for the first time in years uh, higher than five. Now I had one previous blood test uh, where I had uh, yogurt intakes of about 250 grams a day. Um, and that still was able to keep my um, uh, red blood cell counts above five. So with that in mind, I decided again to shoot for around 250 grams of yogurt a day thinking that it would increase my red blood cells above 
which it would be indicative of biological youth, but not too high, where now it's negatively impacting my creatinine and glucose levels and maybe other stuff. And sure enough, that's exactly what I got. So that dot that just popped up is where uh, my red blood cell levels were uh, that correspond to this blood test, 4.97. So, and along those lines, my red blood cells, red blood cells stayed relatively high. I was able to reduce my creatinine levels to their lowest level in 2020, 0 0.93 milligrams per deciliter, which is good. And then my glucose levels improved from 99 to 96 compared to the last blood test, but that's not low enough. Uh, for glucose values between 80 to 94 are optimal. I've made other videos talking about that. So I, I need to identify other factors that are uh, impacting my glucose levels. So what foods may impact them? So um, interestingly, about a year ago, I changed my diet from my a pound or, or more of carrots per day to get enough beta carotene to potentially optimize my albumin levels to uh, orange sweet potatoes. Um, and with an equivalent amount of orange sweet potatoes to get around 55 milligrams or 55,000 micrograms of beta, car uh, beta carotene per day. So I did that thinking that carrots have a lot of sugar, a lot of sucrose, and that would likely be bad for uh, health. So interestingly though, uh, and again, this is data prior to um, this blood test. So having a higher average daily sweet potato intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose levels. I don't know why that is, but this is what the data, it, it, you know, it is what it is. Interestingly too, having a higher carrot intake is negatively correlated with my glucose levels. So in other words, having a higher carrot intake is correlated with lower glucose levels. So based on this data, for my next blood test, I'm going to uh, make sure I'm eating uh, a ton of carrots a day, back to a pound or more a day, and I'm going to reduce the frequency that I eat uh, orange sweet potatoes. Now, that 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 isn't going to be the only dietary change that I make for my next uh, blood test. Uh, I'm also going to add beets back into my diet. So I used to eat beets, raw beets, in smoothies uh, uh, often, and uh, I basically stopped doing that. Um, you know, I had some abdominal pain. Too, maybe I was eating too many beets, you know, 10 to 12 ounces uh, at a time. So for whatever reason, that was causing, you know, some bloating and abdominal pain. So I cut them completely out. Uh, and interestingly, we can see with the with the uh, graph here, with the chart. Um, so when I don't have beets in my diet, or didn't, or have very little amounts of them, uh, we can see glucose levels always higher than 90. But when I, I've had beets in my diet, my average glucose levels were almost always less than 90. So with that in mind, I'm going to add beets back in around four to five uh, ounces, around you know 120 to 150 grams of beets per day uh, in my smoothie, and um, we'll see how that impacts my glucose levels going forward. So CRP is another way I can improve. Uh, it's, a, it's another place where I can improve in, on my blood test, this current blood test. Uh, 0.84 is still about double where it usually is for me. And um, it jumped up in the last uh, couple measure, in the last couple measurements. So it's imperative I get that down since it increases during aging and higher levels. Levels higher than 0.3, around 0.3, are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk in many studies. And again, I've covered that in, in other videos. And I'll link that to in the right corner for, for more info. So which foods are significantly correlated with CRP? So first, um, and this is again shocking to me, but uh, we, what we can see here is that uh, for uh, my average daily flaxseed intake, as that increases, CRP also increases. And that's a strong correlation of uh, 0 0.71, it's, and it's significant uh, with a p-value of 0.02. So that's shocking to me. I didn't expect to see a correlation for higher flaxseeds with a higher CRP. And I should mention I look for correlations between all of my food intake with CRP, and this was the strongest correlation that I identified. So with this in mind, just that should be simple. I'm not eating a ton of flaxseed. This at most is, you know, maybe 12 grams per day on average. Just reduce flaxseed intake and maybe that's enough to lower CRP. Well, uh, you know, improve one biomarker, maybe make another worse. And the reason I say that is because Higher flaxseed is correlated with lower creatinine, and for whatever reason, my creatinine has been increasing over the past year or so. So I'm trying to keep that, uh, you know, from uh, uh, going in the age-related increase, which you know that's it's hard to beat nature, right? So, but I'm trying my best through diet to try to optimize all my biomarkers so I can resist age-related increase. So, based on the flaxseed creatinine data, that would suggest keeping it in. So uh, I should mention no other foods reached uh, statistical significance for the correlation with CRP, but coconut butter was close. So higher levels of coconut butter, and again, not coconut oil, 
but the coconut butter, which is a mix of the coconut meat and the and the coconut milk, and it's blended, and it basically looks like peanut butter. I mean, you scoop it out of a jar. So um, higher levels of that was correlated were correlated with lower levels of CRP, but that was close to significance with a p-value of 0.08. Now, that will become more important in, in a second. So I, I then went past the foods that were associated with CRP, and I looked at, for more insight, potentially more insight, which uh, of the other biomarkers that are found on the chem panel, standard chem panel, and CBC are correlated with CRP. And the strong, strongest correlation there was for CRP with total cholesterol. Uh, so in this case, higher levels of total cholesterol for me are correlated with lower levels of CRP. So then the obvious question is, well, what can I do to increase my total cholesterol and keep it high? For this measurement, even though total cholesterol isn't on this blood test, the, you know, for the phenotypic age calculator, my, blood, my, my total cholesterol was 133, so I have room to improve it. So which foods are correlated with total cholesterol? Which, what can I eat to, to keep it high? Uh, and I just heard all the meat eaters say, just eat more meat, cheese, and eggs, but uh, that may have some negative consequences on my, on my diet. I've covered that in other videos. Uh, so, interestingly, again, coconut butter, higher levels of coconut butter are correlated with higher levels of total cholesterol for me. So, when considering that, I also saw a correlation, even though it wasn't statistically significant, but close to significance for coconut butter with CRP, these data collectively would suggest that higher coconut butter, higher total cholesterol, and however total cholesterol seems to be impacting my CRP, potentially lower CRP. So, I'm going to also, for the next blood test, increase my coconut butter intake uh, from about 20 ish grams, you know, 20 ish grams per day to more than 30, somewhere in the 35 to 40 gram, uh, gram range and see how it impacts the blood test. Hopefully it doesn't mess up the other stuff and it just um, reduces the CRP. All right, that's uh, all I've got for now. Um, have a great day.